said you guys are at mechanically powered negative pressure wound therapy for complex wound management. Good morning. We're halfway through the second day. My name is Jonathan Arnold. I'm a medical director at uh, Great River uh, Wound and Hyperbaric Medicine Clinic in West Burlington, Iowa. And uh, Chris Barrett's up here. He's a podiatrist from the Philly area, and we're going to kind of share this presentation. And uh, most importantly, we want to get through our presentation and try to do a, a job, a good job presenting balanced information and then get to our case studies and your questions. All right, so learning objectives, uh, very basically, we just want to take you through this technology. I hope most of you have had a chance to look at it. If not, it's our job to introduce you to it. Um, we're going to look at some cases um, with using this product and also try to sort of compare and contrast it to existing negative pressure technology. Importantly, this is an FDA approved product. It is a prescription product, so I think just be aware of that and be and understand that it's important that you, there's a indications for use label, and I think it's just important to know that that's there, and we're going to really go through most of that material through the presentation, so I don't want to read that slide to you. Uh, negative pressure therapy is a, is a technology, as most of you know, that has been around for a long time, and we are going to talk about some of the specific, specific evidence that we have to support the use of this product. The original product that I trained with was the electrical system. That's sort of the wound vac type set up right with the electrical pump and the canister and the foam and the drapes. Usually we were doing window painting and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. And we're going to sort of compare and contrast this to the mechanical system that's the main focus of this presentation today. I do think for all practical purposes they have similar mechanisms of action which is important. So this is basically just a cartoon animation slide of some of the basic mechanisms of actions, they're uh, sort of understandable that this is, it does a really good job holding the wound still and pulling the edges together, but it also pulls the fluid away, making it less easy for bacteria to set up and form that sort of complicated biofilm thing that we all deal with every day. Um, there are a couple of things missing from the mechanical. The FDA has had a chance to evaluate them, and that is the macro strain and micro strain piece of this. I think those are important. I think they're there. We're not allowed to talk about it yet. But I do think those items will pop up. So sort of that ability to hold this thing still, pull the edges together, and then the, the foam sort of pinches the base of that wound and stimulates blood vessels to come toward it. And that's where you get your improved granulation tissue base. So where did this thing come from? For those of the, you that don't know, I know a little bit about it. I don't know everything about it. But this was a Stanford biodesign project. So basically a school of design. And uh, this came out of a class, and, it, and the team that got this assignment was a plastics surgeon, a, an engineering student, and a business student, and they did some sort of design from clean sheet, including uh, some surveys, and inside of the surveys were quality of life data that we'll touch on as we move through the, pro the uh, presentation. But needless to say, this really is a product you can hold in the palm of your hand, and you just instantly get the feel that this is going to be nice for people that really don't like the larger system. FDA approval came in August of 2009. So it really is as easy as it looks. For those of you that haven't seen it, um, I was in Miami the other night and uh, we were sending one of these around and, and within about five or 10 or 15 minutes, I saw someone just stick it on their forearm themselves. I mean, that really is how easy, that really gives you just a good illustration of how it looks. And we're gonna sort of talk about the little pieces of the system as we move along here. So really, it, without electricity, uh, because of the, there's some springs up here coiled up on the top of the canister that really do the job of pulling back on this plunger, and that's where you get your negative pressure. Uh, and by doing that, it's able to pull the fluid into the chamber and away from the wound. Uh, needless to say, without the electrical system, there's no audible alert, which has been a really good thing in my view. Rather, there's a visual indicator that pops up in the top of the canister. And minus 125 continuous is the green canister. That's the most popular one the one we almost always use. And moving out from the canister then, here's the clip that you, that you clip onto. There's a little one-way valve here that keeps the fluid from flowing back from the canister toward the wound. This tubing is uh, really easy to uh, use because you can cut it to size. Make sure you've got your tubing where you want it before you make your cut. Then this is a hydrocolloid dressing with a one centimeter grid on it, which is really nice for measuring, then the port's really flexible so you can bend, around, bend it around uh, contoured surfaces. And we'll just keep moving along here. Sort of uh, the weight is really the, uh, one of the huge selling points, right? 0.1 kilograms is really just over two ounces. Again, the pressure is negative 125 continuous. Uh, the, dress, the foam is a blue foam, but very similar structure and function. 
the hydrocolloid dressing is a little bit different, and that's not a tegaderm type drape that you're used to with the electrical system, but rather a hydrocolloid. So it does behave a lot like that, works a little bit better when you warm it up. The cartridge we've already talked about in some detail. It is a continuous therapy, and again, there's no audible alarm. Just be aware of that. This is a neat product that we also keep on the shelf right with this product. Um, it's called Secure Ring, and it's basically a hydrocolloid type dressing that is uh, very similar to some of the ostomy stuff that we're all familiar with working with that we've used to help get seals on the electrical system. And so on contoured uh, surfaces, this really helps just to sort of provide an extra edge for seal. And we can talk a little bit more about that in detail uh, toward the end if you're interested. So the indications for use, again, I just want to present the concept that the, the very similar to the electrical system. Uh, acute and chronic uh, wounds, uh, dehist wounds, uh, just be aware, uh, traumatic, subacute, uh, partial thickness burns even, um, flaps and grafts, just be aware that those items are there and that we need to be familiar with the labeling. Here's the CPT code, you guys may want to snap that one. Uh, there are some size differences in the kits and so there are, just like the electrical system, when you apply this in the clinic, there's a, there's a different CPT code. But importantly, reimbursable, reimbursable and you can get paid for, for putting this on particularly in the hospital outpatient department. But importantly also, as we've uh, moved into this year, I think Home Health is now also able to apply this and be reimbursed, which is great. This is my Blue Man cartoon, sort of just illustrating the head-to-toe availability of this product to help you out. Certainly we've used this on complex uh, ENT reconstructions for uh, head and neck surgery. We've used it for uh, sternal dehist wound, uh, sternal wounds, post-op uh, cabbage that have dehist. Also, the just uh, regular gallbladder surgeries and such, any other abdominal procedures. We're going to look at one of the abdominal wounds that I had in just a little bit. Traumatic wounds, crest injuries. We've had some really tough uh, vascular surgeries in the groin this helped us out with. And then last but not least, the uh, ever-challenging, in my view, diabetic foot ulcer that stuck. So uh, importantly, and again, we're going to touch on these uh, important items to address throughout the presentation. If you have something at the base of the wound, like a bone or a vessel or a nerve or a tendon, just be sure you're, you understand that it's there and how you're going to cover that and how you're going to address it. Uh, and so this is where I just get in touch with my specialist. You know, if it's an orthopedic surgeon referring, um, if it's a podiatrist referring, we're going to just talk about how we want to address those deeper structures. And of course, we're talking about the larger vessels. I think you're going to run into some smaller vessels here and there. Obviously, if you have a cancer that hasn't been treated, it doesn't make much sense to apply negative pressure to that malignancy. Just a quick uh, chart. I think some of this stuff is, is pretty intuitive, but the, the mechanical system handles, a, handles uh, less drainage than the electrical system. So on your larger, heavily, more heavily exudating wounds, you're going to probably opt for the electrical system. But as you transition to less drainage, you can start thinking about the mechanical system. It's obviously very easy to program because there is no programming. You just pull the plunger back and off you go. Uh, actually, you just release it. It's very light. Uh, you do not have to have electricity. And interestingly enough, some of my patients do not have electricity. And uh, the other group, of, there's also a group that has electricity that I don't trust. So I've had some interesting stories about stringing electrical cords to the rocking chair under a carpet and tripping and all kinds of stuff like that. So this is a, just a, a follow-up on that slide. Uh, the small green canister really does fit in the palm of your hand for the most part. The larger electrical system really does not fit in the palm of your hand, and I'm sure you've heard about it from your patients. Uh, the foams, I think, are very similar. The drapes are a little different. We can talk about that as much or as little as you'd like to. Different color of foam, obviously, but importantly, both of the, both of the kits do have a bridge available, and we'll be looking at those as we move through the cases. All right, so the benefit is just a little bit on advanced wound dressings in general. I do consider this an advanced dressing, and we're going to actually look at a study that compared this to other advanced dressings. We've talked about a lot of this stuff already. There is a check valve to prevent backflow. You can cut the tubing to length. Uh, there's a grid to help you measure, and it's obviously very easy to conceal and tuck away, very portable. All right, traditional advanced dressings, we usually start out with these in the wound clinic, and they can be a, a huge variety of dressings. We'll talk about some specifics in a few slides. But basically, these are the things we go to if the wounds are behaving well. And then I started thinking about advanced wounds, advanced dressing systems for wounds that are misbehaving, those that are stuck, 
not reducing by 50% in about a month. You really start, and you also know with your experience in the wound clinic, uh, when a wound is likely to get stuck. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we move along. I do think the advanced dressings provide a little bit better control, a little bit more detailed control of the wound microenvironment. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go ahead. So some of the examples just of advanced dressing products that I use in the wound clinic a lot, a lot of the collagens and collagen silver, ORC. We also use cadexam or iodine. There's a nice uh, BLU study that demonstrates that's a very effective dressing. Um, we have some non-adherent composites, hydrocolloids. We've already talked about those. Then that's part of this system. The alginates, of course, and then, of course, gelling fibers really meant to mimic those. Polyurethane foam is a tremendous advancement, I think, uh, over gauze even. I mean, I think bacteria love gauze. It's a natural fiber. Whereas polyurethane foam, it's a little tougher to stick to. And then, of course, the silver, there's, there's many, many, many silver dressings that offer that additional antimicrobial effect. All right, so just a little bit about the evidence. Uh, the first study I'm going to talk to you about is comparing this product to other advanced dressings. And we'll move through these one by one. This is um, uh, Lerman in 2010. Just looking at this, uh, just looking at the uh, mechanical system against uh, platelet-derived growth factor, and also some of the living cell therapies, and also skin grafting. And what he found was that this group actually did better, which I thought was impressive. So it, this is sort of how I established it in my mind as an advanced therapy. He did find statistical significance. In fact, it looks to me like the mechanical group did improve in about half the time. It's, in a little, it's a small study. It's a single center. It's a retrospective. So you have to consider that uh, in the research power. It did have a high dropout rate. So moving on to a little more powerful study, this is David Armstrong looking at, uh, this is really a non-inferiority trial, just looking at the mechanical versus the electrical system. It's a larger multi-center randomized trial. You can see he's got 132 patients, relatively equally split. He's looking at various points up to 16 weeks and then doing some statistical analysis. This is what we call a non-inferiority study. I think. Uh, the mechanical system may have done a little bit better, but if you think about it, the electrical system tended to be on the larger wounds, and so you try to do the statistical correction for that. All right, and then this is another uh, VO, this is a VLU trial with uh, Bill Marston out of North Carolina. This is the third study. 40 patients, a little smaller group, but, but with some of these VLUs, they're particularly tough. And again, what we found looking at regular intervals uh, the uh, mechanical system did very well, basically as well or maybe a little bit better. And again, I think some of the difference in, in this trial were due to the fact that the electrical system, again, tended to end up on the larger wounds, which makes sense, right? The larger, more volume, more drainage, etc. So now moving into the case presentation, so really just my experience with the product. I'm going to start out with a, with a case that was uh, particularly troublesome to me and challenging. Uh, an old 57-year-old uh, guy with a diabetic ulcer, sub-first, uh, left sub-first metatarsal head uh, lesion. He came in and we had him staged out of Wagner 3 with MRSA. You already know that's going to be tough. He's already lost his right leg, so we're going to do everything we can to help him out. But these are particularly challenging because you know by the time they come in, they've had this lesion for quite some time. A callus has developed, it's leaked and ruptured, and now you're seeing it for the first time. And you'll recognize it there on the left. So we're going to do our best to clean it out and get a culture. Apologize for the lighting on some of these folks. It just gets a little bit washed out on the screen. But we're, we're basically just sitting here watching this thing. We've debrided it. He's on IV antibiotics. We're just kind of waiting around. We're trying to get a seal with the electrical system. And you can tell by the maceration on the wound edge that we're just sort of stuck. And of course, these folks have a pretty good blood supply to the skin and sub-Q, but a not so great blood supply to the deeper tissues. And that's really what we're waiting on here is just to sort of let this thing settle down. We haven't got control of the edema and the drainage yet. We're just moving along several weeks here, actually, before we get anything done. So this was around the time this product was being launched, and I was uh, making some contacts trying to get a hold of it. Um, we had so many different dressings. I don't, I'm not even sure I could remember all the different things we tried, but basically negative pressure therapy, trying to get a seal. And, and almost every time he came back, we did not have the seal, as you guys can tell by looking at the pictures. So we are having some progress here. It's very slow. And he tended to improve a little bit and then fall back off, which I know you guys have all seen. And this is where we got a hold of the, uh, me the mechanical system here, sort of between these two visits. We got a hold of a sample. 
and you can see the huge difference it made just having a good seal and I think this is where this product itself is really once you're moving from those deep tissues into the less draining more superficial aspects of the wounds and we're just going to follow him along now uh, believe it or not this is still draining quite a bit it's a little tiny uh, lesion at this point as far as the, the, the wound measurements but it really doesn't do it justice because you know underneath the skin and sub-Q is a lot of healing and a lot of activity and so we ended up uh, letting that uh, stay on there for a few weeks and just coming in for regular visits and then we actually finished him up with a dehydrated amnion chorion he did he did great and of course even when you see him there at the end of May he's still healing underneath and, and so offloading is huge all right, so moving along, I want, I've got a post-op abdomen for you. Um, you'll know why this is a gentleman that's three, uh, three weeks after a hernia repair. He dehissed, and the, and the surgeon was having trouble getting him qualified, believe it or not, for the back, for the larger electrical system. And so he sent him down to us and asked us to help. And so you'll recognize the wound right away that, that definitely this is a tough wound to dress in general. If, you, if you're using anything other than a, a negative pressure system, you're going to be changing whatever you're putting on that several times a day, right? So this is probably seven and a half, eight centimeters deep, and six or seven proximal undermining uh, toward the upper portion of the abdomen and chest. And you can sort of see those sponge-tipped applicators sticking out to show us those depth and tunnel measurements. But once we got, so I think he's going to come in, and then we're, this is our first visit after the electrical system has been applied on the left-hand panel, so already got some control of that edema, and then within just six days, a really a, a 5, 10 to 5, 16, a tremendous amount of improvement, just having the right therapy on the wound, but still too much drainage really for the mechanical system. This is a guy that was asking me from the time he came in until the time he left to, to have the back off or to have the negative pressure system off, so you guys have been there. All right, so we're still just waiting for the amount of drainage to settle down here. And it's going to happen, I think, around the first week of June. And so still not quite there yet, even though the skin and sub-Q looks really good, still quite a cavity underneath there we're dealing with. And now we've got some of the uh, epithelial tissue coming across the wound. And I believe on the right-hand side was the first day of the mechanical system. Finally, the amount of drainage is down to where we can handle them with a smaller system. And then you can really see just the, just the quality of granulation tissue. The epithelial tissue loves this stuff. It just tops right on. You can really see that. I, the, the pictures up there that you guys are looking at are a little bit washed out, but on the regular monitor, it really looks great. And so now we're really at a point where we can stop, but we're going to go ahead and just because this is a little bit of a special wound, I'm going to go ahead and keep this on until pretty much what you see on the right-hand side there. Still healing, of course. <clears throat> so forearm abscess, a little bit different wound. This is on the right side, right in front of the elbow. A uh, person in the emergency department with MRSA abscess that they've opened. Now, by the time she makes it to us, of course, she's necrosed that piece of skin where the incision was made. <clears throat> so we're going to do a good sharp debridement on that and get it cleaned up. I think that's a really good thing if you're going to be putting negative pressure on in general. But even at the first visit, this is also a person who said, you know, I may not be able to make it back. I'm not sure about my transportation. So this, I think, is a great dressing for those people. <clears throat> so really, in just four days... We've really settled that down. You can also tell we've got a little bit more tissue we have to deal with there at the distal edge. Now she's starting to granulate finally. And then even on the right-hand side, you can, you can really see that wound starting to fill in. She's not really growing any skin just yet. Now early August, uh, starting to epithelialize. And again, we've missed a follow-up there. It's about 10 days, a little bit more than I would expect if we were doing regular visits. So I think it just gives you a good illustration of what a great job this, this system does. If you happen to miss your follow-up or if your seal breaks or whatever. Another post-op abdominal wound, a little bit different person than what we saw the first time. This is a 76-year-old white female, two weeks after an exploratory laparotomy for what turned out to be a benign ovarian cyst. And she's just stuck here with a ton of great skin and sub-Q ready to come across, but she's got a super dry wound base that just needs cleaned out a little bit. There was a pan-sensitive staph there that we treated with an oral antibiotic. And believe it or not, at the base of this wound is actually the two edges of the rectus abdominis. With some, yeah, there was actually some suture material there that I took out. And I think this does a great job securing that. A really relatively deep wound, a thinner patient than we saw with our first abdomen. And now we're just, there's some proximal undermining. You can see with the applicator on the right. Now we're just waiting for it to fill in and settle down. And I think we're going to get done with her 
Uh, now the undermining the tunnel or undermining has gone proximally and now we're just filling in and waiting on it to seal up and i think she was able to get done within i want to say five weeks if i did the math right this is another one i just kept on she was actually very good at keeping her follow-up here <clears throat> this is a little different patient but also on the four on the elbow area left side this is a post-op uh, graft patient for dialysis access that was infected uh, and she's on antibiotics when she comes in already. The grafts have actually been removed, and you can actually see how much edema she's got. This really just needs cleaned up a little bit. Negative pressure on, and now the granulation tissue already at about five days. She missed a visit there probably. We usually bring them in in a day or two. That's how I know that, and so this is already improving quite a bit, and you can tell how much edema has come out of that arm and forearm area already. She still needs to fill in her deep tissue, and she's doing that here. Now starting on the right-hand panel to remodel a little bit and grow some skin. And now we're just waiting. Just a matter of time now. And this is another person I think that we did miss. Oh, she's got her follow-up there, 613, 620. We missed a follow-up visit. But again, you can sort of see how great this, this dressing is just to leave on. If you happen to miss your follow-up, really not a lot of need for anything else. Okay. We're going to hold questions for the end. I, sorry I moved so fast. We've got a lot of stuff to get to, though. This is Chris Barrett. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for coming out. Great crowd. And I'm going to put my timer on because I like to talk, and yeah, and I don't, I don't like sharing. So this is, I'm, I'm used to having kind of more time. So I, don't, I want to make sure I don't go over my time, and, and then uh, we start. We have time for questions. So kind of a little background. Um, Dr. Arnold just kind of gave you a whole kind of, summary of the of the of our negative pressure our disposable device and, and some ways to use it so what i want to do is i kind of want to pile you all with you know all into my car it's a big car and we're all going to drive down to the outpatient wound clinic because that's my frame of reference that's where i work um, i manage a center and i also work at a center so what i want to do is my goal here is not to sell you on a device okay what i'm going to sell you on is negative pressure wound therapy i'm going to sell you on the concept the idea in my opinion that we underutilize negative pressure wound therapy in the outpatient clinic. And there's a reason for that. And certainly I think our negative pressure device, our disposable device, has kind of answered a need. Um, but even though this device has been out for several years, um, I, I think we, we don't appreciate the benefits of negative pressure. So what I want to do, especially in the outpatient clinic, so what I want to do is take you to the outpatient clinic and show you how I use disposable negative pressure. I've been using this device since 2011. Um, so for a long time, and, and I noticed that um, I didn't see a lot of it in use, and I think it came out at a time when really we weren't ready for it. Okay, fee-for-service, we were all about profits. Um, things are changing. If you're reading, uh, if you live in wound care, we're going to value-based healing. Okay, so you need to know your products. You need to know what products give you the best bang for the buck. You've got to get your wound healed quickly, with low cost, and keep your patients happy, patient satisfaction. That's the triple aim of healthcare, right? Outcomes, patient satisfaction, and value. So this device is ideally situated to get you that outcome and kind of follow that triple aim, certainly in the outpatient wound clinic. Now, we're all in wound care, so we've all seen this a million times. Um, we don't get so lucky, okay? The, 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 the powered systems, when they were initially devised, certainly acute wounds, they did very well in pushing those wounds very quickly, large wounds, through the, the stages of healing and, and getting good outcomes in a reasonable amount of time. But as we know, in an outpatient wound clinic, Totally different environment, okay? Totally different animal. And really, the problem with chronic ulcers is unchecked inflammation, okay? That, that's really the, when we hear these wounds are stuck in the inflammatory phase, that's absolutely true. Because um, what happens is we need, we need inflammation. We need a low level of inflammation to, um, to manage bacteria and to clean debris from the matrix to get that wound to move into proliferation. So that's certainly, it's necessary to have inflammation. So we need to have those inflammatory cytokines, those, those serine proteases, those matrix metalloproteases, to get us through to proliferation. The problem is when the wound gets stuck and this, uh, these inflammatory mediators are unchecked, you have this milieu of inflammation that damages our growth factors. It destroys growth factors. It destroys, it, it prevents cells from from um, dividing and, and finding their receptors and migrating because, again, for migration, you need a healthy matrix. So, in fact, if you take acute wound fluid and put it into a cell culture, the cells will divide. If you take chronic wound fluid and put it into that same cell culture, nothing happens. Senescence, okay, quiescence. So, certainly, inflammation is a, a huge problem for the wounds we see in, in an outpatient wound clinic. 
So they require investigation, okay? They require some understanding of the physiology of wound healing, and you have to know your products, when to use them and why. So we certainly have a, a, a concept that we can use to look at a chronic wound and, and try to understand why the wound is not healing and try to address those problems. It's called wound bed preparation. It's really, in my opinion, the foundation of wound care is the concept of wound bed preparation. It was originally developed by pa plastic surgeons in and around 2000, um, and it's a systematic way, okay, it's a guide to looking at a chronic wound. Where are the barriers? Okay, what are the barriers that are preventing this wound from moving forward to proliferation? And then addressing those barriers guides to what do we need to use to address those barriers to get that wound to form a healthy, well-perfused, clean wound bed. That now, when you do an intervention, when you, when you want to use a product that costs money, okay, and has evidence, you know that more than likely you're going to have a clean, a, a, a clean enough wound bed that that product should work. And that's value healing, okay, knowing that whatever you're going to use is hopefully going to give you the outcome you desire. Um, so this was around 2000. In about 2003, the concept of time came out. I'm, I'm sure we've all um, heard of this concept. Um, the time principle, and, and really the, the giants in wound care, Greg Schultz and Gary Sibold, um, Marco Romanelli, um, Vince Falanga, um, they had this advisory panel, got together, and, con and they looked at this concept of wound bed preparation. And when we say local barriers, what they did was they took that idea of barriers and kind of put it into words, okay? So they, they looked at a chronic wound and put it into four deficient areas. So we either have necrotic or non-viable tissue, infection and inflammation, uh, excess or um, a desiccation, excess moisture, excess fluid, or um, a desiccated wound, and then the edge of your wound. So you have this, this, this wound bed where you don't have keratinocytes migrating. Again, you have an unhealthy ECM. So these are your four areas of concern. Um, and so if you look at line one, these are your problems. Line two gives you the, the proper inter intervention, and what you hope to happen is after you uh, apply that intervention, you, you address the, the barrier, the problem, and that wound becomes unstuck, or at least that area of that, that barrier becomes unstuck. And most of your chronic wounds, we're not stuck in one area. We can be stuck in more than one, or we can stuck in all four. And hopefully with my case studies, I'm gonna show you how looking at using the concept of time to investigate and evaluate your wound, and then choosing the proper intervention can get your wound unstuck and, and get your wound moving forward. Okay, so if you look at line two, you see debridement, okay? So if wound bed preparation is kind of the foundation of, of basic wound care, debridement is the primary intervention that's gonna, that, that is really the foundation of your interventions in the time principle. And why is that? What's so is, 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 first of all, I want to ask you, is, is, you know, what's the importance of debridement? How important is debridement and why is it so important? Well, debridement is this important. So, and, and really it comes down to frequency of debridement. So this is, this is data, this is uh, Jim Wilcox, Hillogix data. So we're talking about 525 wound care centers over a four-year period, uh, 312,000 wounds, so certainly a, a very substantial end number, and the outcome measure was complete closure of the wound. So they looked at just looking at diabetic foot ulcers. The breeding the wound once a week, bringing patients back once a week, healed the wound in, in 21 days. Now we all know, what, what's our target in DFUs? Four-week healing, 50% in four weeks. That was you know, Peter Sheehan's landmark data validated by Robert Snyder. So that four-week period, that 50% healing in four weeks is robust data for 12-week healing. So we know if we can get a wound half closed, a DFU in four weeks, we're on that right trajectory. Where well, they were getting wounds debrided weekly in 21 days, so doing a heck of a job. But look what happens when you just add another week to that debridement. So you bring the patient back every other week, what happens? Three times as long to heal that same wound, that diabetic foot ulcer. And the more time you add between debridements, the more time it took to heal. And I'm going to add, I don't have the slide, but um, Robert Warner did another study in terms of seeing patients visit frequency. So, and what, his, what that data found, what, it was just as significant as the debridement data. So when you bring patients back weekly, on, let's look at diabetic foot ulcers, 64% healing in four weeks with a DFU. For patients that came back every other week, 2%. Okay, and then they looked at VLUs. Patients that came back weekly for VLU care, 58% of those wounds healed in four weeks. The ones that came back every other week or longer, zero, zippo. Okay, so seeing patients more frequently in the wound center and the breeding them more frequently in the wound center gets wounds healed significantly faster. So why do you think that is? So I'm gonna tell you that, uh, to give you the answer. Before I came to this talk, I, there was a talk by, uh, by Greg Schultz. Now Greg Schultz was one of the original authors of Time, the concept of Time in 2003. And as you know, he's a um, uh, huge, 
uh, research. A lot of the, the data that I use to, to treat my patients comes from him and, again, some of those giants in wound care. So why does visit frequency and the frequency of debridement, why is it so important in, in healing wounds faster? Well, in 2012, so Greg Schultz and his group in 2003 came up with the concept of time. Okay, 10 years later, he puts out a paper. And he says, and, and this is his group, and they say, what's happened in 10 years? Is time still relevant? Okay, is time still relevant? And what has changed and what, we should, what should we be looking at? Well, look at number one, okay, the, the, the concept of biofilm. And I can tell you, I just came from Greg Schultz's biofilm lecture literally an hour ago. So I can tell you I feel pretty good because, you know, when I put this together last year, I kind of just looked at, you know, again, at a chronic wound uh, center in an outpatient wound clinic, what's really going on? What's really are? Well, here's what they've learned. I mean, biofilms have been around for over 10 years, okay? But back in 2007, chronic wounds weren't even included in the research. Well, now we know in, 20, in 2013, Greg Schultz is looking at this and saying, you know, biofilm's a big problem. And what's the problem with biofilm? Okay, they're completely resistant, almost completely resistant to topical interventions. So uh, these wonderful topical and antiseptics that we're talking about. We have, you know, we have silver, we have PHMB, hypochlorous acid, cadexamer iodine, wonderful products that no longer uh, damage healing cells but, allow the, but kill bacteria. The problem with that is they kill planktonic bacteria. They affect planktonic bacteria in the upper surfaces of the wound. What's the problem biofilm? Biofilms, often biofilms are half a centimeter in depth. Your topicals are doing nothing to affect that. Okay, so, and biofilms. How long does it take a biofilm to reform? Three days. They start reforming in 24 hours. So why do you think that if you bring a patient back every week and debride them and see them more, at least every week, or, and see them every week, that your wound starts to heal? It's because of biofilm. If you wait two weeks, you've you got a fully mature biofilm again. And you can't put your topicals on these biofilms. They do nothing. Um, biofilm is, is DNA, polysaccharides, lipids. They're, they're negatively charged. So you take hypochlorous acid or PHMB or silver. AG plus, positively charged. You put these products on top of a biofilm, they, they adhere to the biofilm. They do nothing. They have no effect. So how do you break, how do you disrupt the biofilm? You debride it. Okay, and what works? I'm going to tell you, when I, when I was doing, I've been doing this talk for over a year, I said, I think the three most effective ways of debridement, certainly sharp debridement, effective sharp debridement, ultrasonic debridement, non-contact ultrasonic debridement. Well, what does Greg Schultz just say an hour ago? Non-contact -con ultrasonic debridement using... You can either use a silver solution, you can use hypochlorous acid, it did much better than saline. But these products work. Okay, so this is 2013, he's telling you, you've got these topical antiseptics that are wonderful, but you have to use them at the right time. But what about, M again, I'm MPWT is my focus here. He's also said in 2013, the use of negative pressure wound therapy. Well, why is that? Well, here's my, this is what he said in this paper about MPWT. It may help loosen slough and necrosis. So it helps your sharp debridement become more effective. And we all know, you, you add negative, this is my whole idea with my, with, uh, when, I, when I take care of patients in the wound clinic and my, stu my uh, case studies. Adding negative pressure wound therapy with other, you know, bringing multiple procedures together, okay? Debridement, negative pressure wound therapy, collagen. Combining therapies um, help support the time principle. So in my opinion, I added MPWT to all four areas. Why? Because again, you debride the wound. So you've now taken a biofilm phenotype, okay? And you broke, you've dispersed it. You turn them into planktonic bacteria, what happens now? Planktonic bacteria can be affected by topical antiseptics. They can also be affected by negative pressure. Because what does negative pressure do? What are the five things that it, it you know, draws the wound edges together, increases perfusion, and, you know, again, microstrain, macrostrain, so perfusion and granulation tissue, and we know it manages, manages exudate, but how about managing planktonic bacteria? What does that sponge do? So you've debrided the wound effectively, whatever way you choose, so now you have a planktonic environment that can be affected by negative pressure, it can be affected by um, your topical antiseptics. How about collagen? You know, with the FDA, you know, KCI Acelity can't say that collagen and MPWT in my clinic, in my hands, I'm going to show you case studies, putting collagen and MPWT together, because what's the big problem in chronic wounds? It's proteases, okay, serine proteases and MMPs. So when you debride a wound and you've broken up the biofilm, so now your eye in, in time is also inflammation, okay? So negative pressure can manage some of those bacteria, can also add with collagen, which now manages the proteases. Certainly, you know, negative pressure is managing moisture, keeping a moist wound bed. And now what about the, the edge of the wound? You've taken on a neuropathic ulcer, all that callus, and you now have a fresh, viable wound edge. And if you can add other, again, multiple products, add some CTPs, add some, uh, whether it's a skid graft, use it as a bolster, but adding negative pressure wound therapy to the four areas in the time principle 
it, it promotes better outcomes, faster outcomes. Okay, so again, value. Very inexpensive product, disposable negative pressure, collagen, very inexpensive product. Put them together in an outpatient wound clinic. See your patient more frequently, better for the wound center, but your wounds will heal better. Okay, and the evidence shows that. So, and I just, this is a Vicky Driver study, I just like throwing that in because I like real world data, right? Out of, this is retrospective, looking at the, the chart, patients who got negative pressure wound therapy. This is not just outpatient clinic, but I love MPWT. I just think it's such a valuable, I mean, you look at the five things MPWT does. What single dressing can do all that? Okay, again, working at the wound bed. You put a, a sponge on a wound, it can be a well designed sponge, but it's a passive dressing. MPWT is active. It's actively working on the wound bed. And again, you can use it as a dressing. Okay, instead of putting sponge, put MPWT over your collagen or over your graft, or just put it on twice a week after you the breed. It does more than just sit there. Okay, and this is why I love MPWT. Here was the big problem. The powered systems were designed for patients, uh, again, in the hospital, acute wounds, surgical wounds. Patients in an outpatient wound clinic have certain challenges. Well, what's the biggest challenge? You know, they have a life. They want to continue to live that life, quality of life. So they want to go to church. They want to be able to sleep. They want to go to a restaurant and have somebody say, what's that thing gurgling on, on your shoulder? Okay, you know, how about patients that want to work? You're going to see one or two of my case studies. These are working people. They can't take a powered pump into the work with them. Um, and how about the fall risk, you know, with the, with the hose, the long hose, the weight? Again, you're going to see my case studies. Patients in an outpatient clinic have certain challenges that really the powered pumps were not designed for. So this is why the, the disposable negative pressure was, is just an ideal product for this subset of patients in the clinic that really will do much better with a disposable, ultra-portable system, okay? Now, and I think this slide was already shown, but you have two options in the outpatient wound clinic. We have the, the normal powered system, and we have disposable negative pressure. It's based on wound size. The largest um, dressing in, in the disposable uh, portfolio is 15 by 15, and you want to have about two square centimeters on each, on, on, around the sponge, you know, a little bit of a gap. So again, the largest wound roughly is 13 by 13. What's the average size in an outpatient wound clinic of a wound? It's about three square centimeters, a little less. So for the most part, all of your wounds in an outpatient wound clinic will pretty much be a right, the right size for, for a disposable. Um, and, and wound drainage, that's really our driver, okay? It's a 60 cc cartridge, two to three times a week, 120 to 180 mils a week. That's your guide, okay? Wound size and, and, and but here's the real key. Look at the um, um, coverage criteria. With, with standard MPWT, it's, it's DME, you have to fill out an application, wait for approval, has to get delivered, and your wound size has to be greater than one by one. And sometimes you can't even do it in the first 30 days. You have to use standard care. With disposable, you can use it day one, okay? Well, guess what? When you debride the wound, if you wait four days, you've got a maturing biofilm. So why do you think patients did better when they were seen more frequently and debride it? Because you, you're, you're keeping that wound in a planktonic state, which can be affected by your topicals, by MPWT. That's when I want to use negative pressure, the day I debride it. So it's on my shelf, the disposable negative pressure. You purchased it. You have a CPT code. You use it day one and keep using it. And you're going to see, just like my case studies, wounds will respond to that, that algorithm. So here's your algorithm. If your wound is a type that can be used MPWT, look at the, the contraindications, the same as, as powered systems, okay? If you don't have any of those contraindications, the wound size and the wound drainage, that's what drives your decision making. But really, what drives your decision making is the patient, okay? If the patient's a better fit for a disposable type of uh, a portable, lightweight disposal, then that's the best choice for them, not the powered. Yes, you can still use the powered system on any patient in an outpatient wound clinic, but disposable negative pressure, lightweight, portable, day one, is really ideal for the challenges we have in an outpatient wound clinic. So let's do some of my studies. So first you're going to say, because the first study you're going to go, wait, this guy's a podiatrist. What is he doing treating this type of wound? So I've been doing wound care. Uh, I specialize in wound care for the last 16 years. I worked in a university hospital for, for eight years, um, kind of getting um, a lot of my experience. So I worked with a lot of non-podiatric, non-lower extremity wounds, worked with WOCNs, neurosurgeons, ENT. So I, I got used to treating wounds, okay? So in my current position, um, I'm kind of a consultant. So I know the products, and so I get asked to, to consult on a lot of them. And I, my colleagues are all in the wound center, so we're all buddies. So I just, these are patients that I made a decision that I think um, negative pressure was the way to go, made some um, um, ID, uh, recommendations, and kind of followed the patients. I did all these dressings myself. All the HBO patients that come into my clinic, I take care of them, so a lot of them are, you know, my case studies. So you're going to see the first one is a radiation wound of the axilla. So she was 65 years old, it's 2013. 
Um, she had cancer, had chemo radiation, um, and 21 years later, she came to us with a small pinhole, had a little serous drainage. It was biopsied negative. But the problem is she had an irradiated area that they just created a surgical wound. And well, guess what happens? You have a, basically ischemic tissue, and the wound didn't heal. So plastic surgeon sends, a, a, sends her to us for HBO therapy, because that's the only way you're going to return, you're going to get angiogenesis in irradiated tissue. It takes time, but that's the only way. Okay, and it works wonders. So she's going to do HBO. The plan was we're going to do a flap to close this, this wound. She was not looking forward to that. So this was a five-month case. So I'm not going to give you five months' worth of slides, but at this point, I decided to use disposable negative pressure. If, what do you have to do, to, 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 again, to wound bed prep, you have to have perfusion. So at this point, after some light debridement, collagen, we, I, I felt it, it was appropriate now to do a little bit more aggressive intervention. So we're using negative pressure. And what you're going to see happening is the wound starting to contract. This is basically collagen and negative pressure. That's it, okay? I'm not going to put any expensive products on it because it's not prepped yet. It's not ready yet. Angiogenesis take, takes a lot of time, okay? With HBO, typically three months, 40, 60 treatments, takes a lot of time. So now we see the wound is healing. It's getting better slowly. Um, but at this point, this is what I've got. I've now got perfusion, okay? I've got blood. I've got angiogenesis going on. So I think now we have better wound bed prep. The topical sh intervention should be more effective. Cryopreserved piece of skin. And this is how we get, th think about it, axilla, okay? It's a moist, wet area, um, very difficult seal. Not with disposable negative pressure. There's the poster child for disposable negative pressure, right? I mean, look what she's got going on. You know, bags, um, canes, um, coat. This is the middle of winter. So, and she's wearing the disposable device on her right shoulder. Nobody sees it. Nobody knows it's there. That this is maintaining her quality of life. And all of a sudden now we've got, because of those growth factors, this wound went on to closure. Five months, I added one piece of dehydrated amnion, um, and the wound went on to closure. So, you know, again, radiation wounds are not four weeks, 50%. They take a lot of time and a lot of, but I, I, in this case, I don't think we really overdid it with the topicals. It was just the basics. Negative pressure wound therapy, collagen, some debridement. She's coming in every day for HBO, so I had a captive audience. So um, did very well with that, that, uh, um, that method. Uh, so this is another cool case. This is the working person. Okay, I said, what are some of the challenges in an outpatient clinic? This gentleman worked at a Boeing plant, building helicopters outside of Philly cannot bring a powered system in. He's on disability. So this is, I'm setting this up because I don't have a lot of pictures, but he stuck his arm up to a drop ceiling and got a pinch, just a sudden sharp pain, thought nothing of it, went back to work. Two weeks later, it comes to us because he had gone to the clinic and said, you know, something's going on with this forearm. So he comes to us and the doc that um, did the workup, you know, said HBO, you know, uh, it, we're assuming it's, a, it's a, a venomous insect. We didn't have the insect, but certainly you're gonna see, you know, in terms of where he was and what he was doing, it wasn't a scratch. Okay, he described it as a sharp pinch and he had a little, just a, a pinpoint. So this is what, when he came in for, for HBO's first treatment, because HBO, there's some anecdotal evidence that it's good against toxins and, you know, for brown recluse spiders. So, you know, we want to get him healed fast and we thought this would accelerate it. So he comes in day one and I look at this and go, you know, there's, this thing needs a blade. So I had the doc on call. I said, you know, this needs to be opened. Now, this is after opening it up. So this is the forearm and this is, this is, Toxins. This is, you know, if you're sci-fi, aliens, you know, with the acid for blood and it hits and just starts melting everything underneath it. Well, that's, he was bitten, and this is two weeks later, just, just eating everything. This was not pus. This was not infected. Okay, that's peri-wound inflammation. Not, he doesn't have a cellulitis. He had toxin. So he's day one. I start packing this with a silver alginate for the first week. Because, again, proteases, bacteria. Let's calm it down. And then after the first week, I, I put the dressing on. Okay, now he wants to go back to work, so I'm going to put a, I, I put Tubi Grip, you know, a compressive sleeve over all my dressings. It keeps hands away, a little bit of compression, but he wants, to, he wants to work, so I just, I put two layers. Under the first layer, I put the canister and just put another layer of Tubi Grip over that, and he had complete mobility. This is three dressings later, three negative pressure dressings, completely granulated. You can, this is wound bed prep, you can do whatever you want with this. All we did was just continue on with negative pressure until he got to this point. A little bit of a dermatitis, but he went on to heal in a little over four weeks. In 17 HBO treatments, we stopped. Can I tell you that he didn't go on disability, which he absolutely did not want to do. And the workman's comp company, very happy. We didn't abuse it. Okay, we got him healed fast, and he was, never missed a day of work. Happy patient. Okay, in complete closure. Venous leg ulcers, all day long. You saw the data. Everybody in the clinic is your number one wound. You can be treating these things all day. They love negative pressure. They love collagen. Again, inflammatory wounds. They love that 
combining. So this is a Marine, ex-Marine, you know, you know, tough as nails, non-compliant, always traveling to see his buddies. So he's still back with us. He's always going to be back with us. But in this wound, my, my doc put a, a, a piece of tissue on, expensive tissue, wasted it, because um, he used the wrong I and, and the wrong M in time, moisture balance. So this is what happens. So look at the peri wound. You've got all these small wounds around the peri wound from, from exudate. You can't put a polyurethane drape on because it's going to leak. But guess what? The hydrocarloid's a dressing. You can put it over the small wounds. It will manage the exudate. So do you have TIME? Yes, you have, certainly have necrotic tissue. You have infection and inflammation. You definitely got bile burden. 90% of all chronic wounds, Greg Schultz, 90% have, have bile film. It's a big problem. It's a problem we're talking about now. So you've got, the, you've got proteases? Absolutely. I can't measure, but they're there. Okay. Moisture imbalance was the big problem. And there's nothing going on with the epithelial life. This is time. This is time. So I'm going to add my collagen. I'm going to treat it. This is an ECM collagen, so I'm going to put a little non-adherent over it, treat it like a tissue product. My, there's my hydrocolloid covering all those small wounds. Three weeks later, and th what, what's the mainstay of venous leg ulcer? It's compression. Can't, you can't forget compression because you're doing negative pressure. You've got to do it together, and you can do that. I just left the, the hose outside, made little cuts, and this is three weeks later. Okay? Peri wounds taken care of. You've got, think of TIME. The T's good. Tissue looks better. You've got epithelialization, um, proteases are managed. It, it's working. All I did was continue to add till I got to this point. Collagen and a cheap disposable negative pressure dressing. Okay, I'm doing that twice a week. Okay, and he's, he's doing wonders. Uh, this is another cool case. I'm going to try to be fast. Um, orthopedic surgeon, 5 o'clock on a Friday. What orthopedic surgeon's calling on a Friday? Because this guy's a little bit nervous. He had a uh, right tino suspension that had dehisced and failed, got infected. He took care of it again, it dehissed again. He said, I've got a small deep wound, and if this thing fails, I'm in trouble, she's gonna have disability, do you have any tricks? Yes, I do. Came in the next, on Monday, had the doc, another doc, I said, you know, I talked with the doc, I think, uh, you know, disposable is gonna be the answer, and sure enough, small deep wound, doesn't drain very much, in an elderly patient who wants to be active, who wants to maintain her quality of life, there's my dressing. Now this is my first one, not the prettiest, I mean, you know, um, but, but it doesn't matter because your seal is right with the ring. That, that hydrocolloid ring allows you to put small dressings in difficult places and you don't need a lot of excess, okay? And there's my tubi grip, she had a spica brace. Kept the spica brace going, tubi grip, slid it under, complete mobility of her hand, three dressings later, same thing. Three, I, I, I looked at it, one, two, three, we're done, and she's completely granulated, healed in one more week. So that's, you know, three weeks, she's healed. Happy patient, happy doctor. Uh, last one, T uh, so DFUs, obviously I got to give you a DFU, but again, it, it, you, can, you can put all the great topicals you want, but if you don't offload diabetic foot ulcers, all of a waste of time. Okay, quality measures, TCC or a non-removable full length boot, those are your options if you want to do it the right way. So these things heal all day. The, the, the evidence shows DFUs with a TCC, six, seven weeks, 90% healing to seven RCT. So, you know, I, I love it. I love TCCs on these because I just tell them we're going to heal you up, no problem. So 1017, he said, nope, don't want to cast. I don't want to deal with it. I said, do you realize the risky? You, you know, a diabetic foot ulcer, the, the five-year mortality rate, breast cancer and prostate cancer, add them together, it's still greater. Just that diabetic foot ulcer. It's an independent predictor of early mortality. Norway did a 10-year population health study. Independent predictor, okay? It was validated. There's no other, there was no other risk factor. That diabetic foot ulcer is a killer, okay? So this is a killer problem. We'll, but we ignore it for the most part because we put them in post-op shoes. But anyway, so he refused TCC up until 1120. I said, you're, you're looking at osteo, you're looking at BKA, and you're looking at dying. I said, early. You understand? I think he got it. He said, all right, I'll do it, doc. So the breed, the breed, the breed. After six casts, I'm figuring this guy's healed by now. This thing was stuck for two weeks. Could not get it unstuck. Now, I'm going to say another podiatrist was treating this. I was doing the casting, and I said, what do you think it is? Well, circulation was great. Get really having any exostosis, what do you think it is? 90% of all wounds, it's biofilm, it's gotta be. So we did an aggressive debridement, we, we curetted the base and we took a tissue nipper on the wound edge and just kind of freshened it up. Now I'm gonna hit it with collagen, I'm gonna hit it with a cast, and I'm gonna hit it with negative pressure, okay, all together. So under a TCC, works like a wonder. Um, for the, I, I, put, oop, I put a little piece of foam, four by eight, just to, to cover the, the, the hose, okay? And this is four casts. So basically two more weeks and he was completely healed. So again, looking at it, TIME, what's going on, inflammation and proteases or, or biofilm and proteases, probably those two, because the wound bed looked good. The breed, the breed, the breed, and add a few couple, couple of products and the wounds gets unstuck and moves forward. So 
this is the deal. This is, this is what disposable negative pressure is all about. It's about patient quality of life. They're happy, you get better outcomes. You're gonna be, when reimbursement's based on, on your, your happy, the patient happiness and your, 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 uh, your value-based healing, you're ahead of the game because the patients love this thing. So it's good for, again, for triple aim of healthcare. It's good for the patients, they're happy. I like it because I can use it day one. I can customize the dressing, put it wherever I need it to be because I got the ring and I got the hydrocolloid. It's disposable, day one, build the RCT. It's not a big money maker, but who cares? Okay, multiple things together, get your wounds healed very quickly, and you're ahead of the game. And again, it's off the shelf, so that's, that's what I love about it day one. So it's, it's, um, it's all about wound bed prep, and, and again, all these different issues, elderly, small wounds, but how about home care patients? As of January 1st, home care can now do SNAP. And the beauty about this is home care gets a lump payment, right? And then when I order all the dressings, we just keep taking that money away. Well, guess what? With, with disposable, they can keep that money because I'm just using negative pressure, okay? That's what I ordered. They're doing it, and they get paid separately. So they get paid and make some money on, on disposable, and they don't even touch the lump sum payment. It's a money maker for home care too, and the patients get better. So this is a whole other discussion. I can't, we can't do it today. So don't throw it on the worst of the worst. Okay, put it on, on, on don't put it on train wrecks, okay? Get, try it on a nice, easy wound and get some good hands-on experience, and, and you'll get a good outcome and you'll want to use it more. And that's my sell on negative pressure, negative pressure wound therapy. Think about it more. Thank you. Sorry, I went over a little bit. Um, questions? Thank you for a good presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one question for both of you, actually, and it's pertained to the hyperbaric. In your presentation, you had a diabetic foot ulcer, Wagner 3, but you did not mention any options for hyperbaric treatment. In your case, also, you mentioned that this patient who had an insect bite and then you put him on 17 treatment for hyperbaric. Is this a new indication? Thank you. Yeah, great question. So the question, uh, as you guys heard, is about hyperbaric. So our first diabetic foot ulcer guy, um, unfortunately with the Wagner 3s, we're stuck waiting, I think, for 30 days. And we have to demonstrate that really we've shown adequate blood supply and that the wound essentially has not improved in that 30 days. And that did happen in that case. He was in hyperbarics. Uh, and that's when we started really seeing the edema coming down and getting a better seal and wound improving. So great question, good point, and that's why I'd love to stick him straight in, but sometimes you just have to wait a little bit and get everything in line. And good question with the HBO, and the, not the first person who said, how do you get that in the chamber? He's workman's comp, so all rules go out the window. Basically, workman's comp is an open checkbook, okay? Yep. But, there, I mean, we don't throw anybody in the chamber. There's, there's good, it's anecdotal, but there's good evidence, you know, pretty solid evidence that the toxin from a brown recluse, and we didn't know if that was what it was, but we're assuming something like that, that it's actually good at neutralizing it, and we found that it actually just it allows that toxin to just stop eating away tissue, and I kind of felt we, that's what happened, so we don't have, I think we've had two of those types of patients, but it does very well in the chamber. And we didn't have to do it a lot. It was less than 20. Do I have to stand up? Uh, hi, my name is Sandy. <clears throat> I work in pediatrics, um, and also a plastic surgeon on grafts, so that would be my biggest concern is the negative 125 pressure, that you can't drop to 75. You know? Yeah, great question. Um, there are some other pressure settings available. There's a 100 and a 75, and I think we've had great success with all those different pressure settings. So those canisters are available. Great question. Yep. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a nurse at a wound clinic in Utah. Um, I just wanted to ask, how do you guys get around um, patient compliance with this system? Because we've had a lot where the patient will come back in for the next visit and then they didn't notice that the pressure had changed so they didn't ever use the pump to pump it back up at home. Yeah. Well, so how do you guys get around that? Because we kind of went away from the snapback for that reason. So, Even on our really, you know, yeah. educated patients. So, and that's, again, another good question. Another, the problems I have with, the, with, with just like that with patients who don't understand the concept of repriming, the red line that tells you it's not working, if they're looking at you like you've got three heads and they just don't get it, that's where I had trouble with those types of patients. They come back the first visit and it's red and they never, oh, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And I said, oh, we told you, you know, a hundred times. So now we have home care. If these patients are good home, if there's, if there's another reason why home care can see these patients in the home, that's the type of patient that does well with home care. Because again, this is not a revenue driver in the wound care. I don't care if I'm doing it in the wound care centers do, or the, the home care is doing it, as long as the patient's getting what I want to put on them. And home care 
should love this because they're going to get paid for it and they're going to keep their money, but home care can now address the issues. But don't forget, this is a hydrocolloid, so if they have a, a red line, you don't have to change it in two hours. They can come back the next day, okay, because again, that hydrocolloid is going to manage some of that fluid. These are sl slow-draining wounds, light-draining wounds, so they're not, you know, they're not those typical. But yes, there's, that's an issue. If patients don't get it and they just can't understand and they're always coming back with the dressing off, either if they're ambulatory and they can't get home care, then I hate to say it, that's a problem. You know, you just re the reality is not everybody's going to work, but I think, you know, explanations, if there's family members, they can help. But if not, home care, and if that's not the case, then maybe negative pressure is just not the best, you know, choice for them. What form of collagen are you guys using? Yeah, well, I mean, I use, I have three different collagen, so, and I, I think some of them work better in certain wounds. I like some as an ECM type of collagen, and I don't want to get into product, you know, because I have my personal preferences, but like I said, I have three types of collagen, three different ones that all seem to work very well, but I love collagen with negative pressure. I don't care which one you use, proteases. If you can use collagen with negative pressure and attack proteases and bacteria, they're not allowed to say it, KCI, until FDA is coming. They will be able to say it, but I'm telling you, in my hands, it does great together. It doesn't interfere with the suction? No, I don't think so. You know, it degrades. I mean, it's, it, it ends up being broken down by proteases. Pretty quick. So it's, it's not a, you know, it doesn't turn into it. It just basically degrades. And collagen ORC is biodegradable. Completely ORC is just completely biodegradable. It disappears. So no, it doesn't affect it all. Hi. Um, my question was, what's the standard of frequency for dressing changes? Um, and then also, what's an acceptable amount of non-viable tissue within the wound bed for application? Okay, so generally speaking, we try to recommend like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday on these. I think that's the official indication. Uh, but we will a lot of times offer like a, like a Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday type, type setup. And we just, everybody's a little bit different. As you guys know, all these wounds are a little bit different. They want a little bit different things. And so we just try to custom tailor it. If I'm a little bit worried about it, I'll bring them sooner. If I'm not so worried, I'll bring them later. Um, that's the interval. And it, there's not a lot of, what was the other part of your question? Oh, the necrotic tissue, I'd love to get that stuff out. Uh, I think there were some pretty good pictures of acceptable amounts. You saw what I said in the time, what Schultz said. You'd actually, I'm not a big, you know, I see a little bit of sloth, a little bit of fibrin. I like negative pressure on top of it. I'm yeah, telling you, it just dissolves it, it softens it, yeah. easy to come off. You know, they, what, what's the, the KCI recommendation is 30% with the vac, I think. I mean, you see heavy necrotic tissue, got it to breathe. You know, you should be debriding these, and then you have a clean wound bed, and, and you know, on, on goes negative pressure, and it just, from there, it sh you shouldn't see much necrotic tissue, because if your wound's been, you know, the patient's been optimized, it should, it, it should just go on to heal. Got a mic? So did they just have one kind of foam compared to KCI with the black and the white, and if they do, is it fine for packing? It doesn't tear when you try to pull it out of a track? It's, it's, yeah, the blue foam's it for mechanical. Um, it works very well to cut it and put it in places as long as you're careful counting and making sure you're getting all the material out. Um, I've also used the collagen and depending on the size of whatever undermining or tunnel you're talking about. And there's other, you know, even, we've even gone in and gotten the polyvinyl white foam, if, you know, for not really sure. It's a little tougher, you know, from the regular electrical system and used it with the mechanical system. So lots of options and it's pretty, pretty durable stuff. A little different, but very similar. I haven't used I haven't used white foam with it. Um, Dr. Arnold may have you know again because usually you have to bump the pressure up. But you know small piece I don't think it's a big yeah. problem. But normally if I have a blind tunnel you know and I, I'm stuff I, I don't want that to disappear. But if you could see the tunnel if you can feel it and you're pretty confident that you're not going to lose the foam, mm -hmm. it's reticulated open cell foam same as the black foam. Yeah. So they do the same thing. Yeah, I think the key on the tunnels is just sort of not jam packing them. You know let the foam collapse and and just monitor it closely. I'm intrigued by the use of it with the TCC. Can you go over again how you padded or protected that? Yep. So really, no. first off, with TCCs, padding is bad, okay? I'm just telling you that the original design of total is, is intimate contact with the least amount of material between the plantar foot, the cast, and the skin. So that's the issue I have with some of these other kits is that there's a lot of stuff, you know, that they think is that, that's good for offloading. No, I want intimate contact, okay? so. When I put that, the, the, the hydrocolloid dressing on, I'm just wrapping it with the, the, the kit. I'm putting my, my cast padding and my stockinette, just like I would any other wound. There's no extra padding over the dressing. Um, 
because again, 30 to 40 percent of the weight reduction is on the cone of the cast, up on the leg. That's where your, your offloading is going. It's not be just offloading on the foot. You're reducing a lot of plantar pressure, so you're not going to put excessive, pr that, that ring softens. Okay, so there's nothing on the bottom of the foot, and don't forget that port is being pulled up off the foot. So it's, it's completely, it's a thin dressing that's on the bottom of the foot. There's no pressure there. Somebody asked me once, did that, the, the, the and take a look at it in the booth. Um, the bridge dressing has foam behind it. So when it's sitting on the skin, it's, it's got a foam backing. The hose, I put a four by eight piece of, uh, two, it was like a $3 piece of foam, and that's where the, the foam, the, the hose rested on that foam. And then I put my cast over it. The cast is not compressive. It should not be a tight cast. And as soon as they start walking, a little edema comes down. That thing is not tight anyway. There, there's, there's no problem there. I had a thick piece of foam, no issues. But you have to use the bridge to get the, the, the port off the, off the foot, but it's not going to go all the way up to the top like the, the vac. So you have to kind of improvise a little bit with, the, uh, with some foam. And it worked wonders. Again, just combination therapy.